Since the earliest cavemen looked up at the sky, people have been seduced by space. Even today, its awesome majesty and sheer beauty continue to attract followers. Only now, they've traded their caves for sheds. Inside these makeshift structures is the world of the amateur astronomer. Behind these doors are a band of people separated by age, background and skill, yet united by one thing, their love of the heavens. When I was 11, I joined the British Astronomical Association, and so I thought one day I'm going to have a big telescope and contribute. And about uh, well, four years later, when I was 15, I actually built my own telescope and started making observations. You can see all these galaxies, planets in books, but I still rather look through a telescope and see the actual thing, see the light from this object going directly after perhaps traveling for millions of miles through space, coming directly, going right into my eye. Sun's still shining. There is an aesthetic side to astronomy. I mean, the very beauty of the night sky. To go out and look at lunar observations, for example, the moon is a very beautiful place when you look at it. So I, I, I think about that. I think about the footprints of the astronauts that are still there. I'm really not quite certain what, what the fundamental drive is. It's just that it's quite important to know, quite important to be certain, quite important to see that there is a big universe out there. But is there more to amateur astronomy than simply stargazing? How important are these unpaid part-timers in unravelling the secrets of the universe? Astronomy has never failed to pull the crowds. In fact, some events happen so rarely, like the transit of Venus between the Earth and the Sun, that if you miss it, you're unlikely to see it again in your lifetime. For most of us, this is as close to astronomy as we get. But for a small group of enthusiasts, it's only the tip of the iceberg. An amateur astronomer is somebody who loves astronomy. I mean, the word amateur means amour. It means to love. And they are passionate about astronomy. They live in this sort of twilight world. They, they have their own day jobs. But what they're living for is to look at the stars at night. There are more than 40,000 amateur astronomers in Britain today, looking at everything from planets to variable stars and supernovae. Some observe for fun, while for others, it's a full-time hobby. But what unites them in this twilight world is a common interest which can be traced back to their childhood. In 1957, Brook von Tee produced uh, 50 outer space cards. Uh, and I was nine years old at the time, and I spotted them and I, I fell in love. Those 50 cards, oh God, my family must have drunk tea till we were kind of orange. Because you could never, it was always the same when you collected cards, you could never get all of them. You know, you always ended up with 15 Venuses and no Jupiter or something like that. But we drank away and, and bought lots of tea, and I, I filled up a little, a little uh, album that you could get free if you sent off it. Uh, but they were very informative, and, and even if I close my eyes now, I can, I can picture the exact shade of Jupiter on one of the cards. I think it was number nine with all the, all the planets on it. Jupiter was purple, as I recall. And I, just, I, I was just astonished that all this stuff was known about and written down, and, and, and that, that began a, a lifelong interest. The 1957 Brook Bond tea cards signalled a revival of interest in astronomy that had waned during the two world wars. Several national and international events also swelled this tide of enthusiasm by bringing space into people's homes. This first satellite was today successfully launched in the USSR. Until two days ago, that sound had never been heard on this earth. 
Suddenly, it has become as much a part of 20th century life as the whir of your vacuum cleaner. It's a report from man's farthest frontier, the radio signal transmitted by the Soviet Sputnik, the first man-made satellite as it passed over New York earlier today. The launch of Sputnik in 1957 heralded the start of the space race, which turned the sky into a new political playground for the Russians and Americans. It also turned everyone's eyes heavenwards for the first time since the war. There's no doubt there was a space race. The Russian and the Americans were trying to beat each other, and the space race did boost space research along, and therefore astronomy well. And that's where, in a way, I come into the story. The start of Patrick Moore's landmark TV series, The Sky at Night, in 1957, coincided with this new fascination with space. So popular was it that it turned him into a household name and opened up the world of astronomy to a wider public. Good evening. Well, this is the 50th Sky at Night. We began the series way back in April 1957, and look how much has happened since then. In those days, space research was still at a very early stage. Well, since, we've had the Sputniks, we've had the American Earth satellites, we've had the planetary probes, and, of course, we've had the first men in space. But as well as that, we've had a lot happening, too, on the purely astronomical field. Uh, we've had several bright comets, and we've had a close approach of Mars, and, of course, we've had the total eclipse of the Sun last February, which we were able to televise direct. We didn't have a television until I was about 10, but yes, then I started watching Patrick Moore's Sky at Night, and already he gave the impression of having been around describing the universe since the Big Bang. Um, to, to, to me and, and, and to hundreds of thousands of others, you know, he was the voice of the universe. There is definitely a lightning over there now, George, can you see it? It's coming out, yes, there is the moon, I can see it for the moment. No, it's gone again. It's gone, it's however... It's infuriating, there's nothing one can do. People don't watch the sky at night for the astronomy, they watch it for Patrick, for goodness sake. He is the quintessential amateur astronomer. He loves astronomy. He's got his telescopes in his garden and all that kind of thing. He loves telescopes and cats. And he's been, you know, he's so influential. One thing you want to try and do is to make a complex subject look simple. Well, I try and do that. Others do it better than I can, but I try and do that. Also in the sky at night, we mix things up. Some programs are far more abstruse than others. And after all, you know, astronomy now is such a vast subject, no one can cover it all. And your astronomer who is researching on distant galaxies may not know much about the atmosphere of Mars. Therefore, we're watched by people of all kinds of things, professional and amateurs, and all ages, from 6 to 90. Armed with Patrick's know-how, the public's interest in astronomy grew rapidly through the 60s as astronauts broke through new frontiers in space. I think for anyone who wasn't older than about, say, seven or eight in 1969, they've really missed what, what an incredible era that was because you went in the state of a few days from landing a man on the moon being total science fiction to it being uh, science fact. <laughs> 